have some great resources for you that'll go beyond reconstruction and all that. Um, but the first thing I wanted to share with you guys is a project that I've been working on with Jay, Michelle, and Chastity called Texas History for Teachers, which I think is up on the screen for you guys right now. Um, we mentioned this the very first day, but I want to mention it again because we've, we've gone through the period of reconstruction. And this is a project we're building at the University of North Texas that's focused on provide, providing resources for educators, being um, lesson plans, videos, primary sources, all kinds of stuff that you guys can use in the classroom. And you can see it's divided up basically the way that the teaks run through um, all the different eras in Texas history. We've separated some things like instead of Civil War and Reconstruction, we have a whole section on the Civil War and a whole section on Reconstruction. And I want to brag on Chastity because she is the lead educator who developed the most of the almost all of the primary or the uh, pedagogical materials we have in our reconstruction unit. So if you need more resources, more materials, more things than we've already given you, which there's a lot, but we're always looking for uh, new things, other things. There's a lot of wonderful things in here that have been developed by Chastity. I can't recommend them highly enough. It's a, a series of lessons that all connect and build on each other and is mapped to the teaks, like all the materials that we are building into the project right here. So I just wanna emphasize that for you guys and point out that all the sections of the project, not just reconstruction, but all the sections of the project, one of the focuses that we've been building on this is, is building out voices as we call them, which is you know bringing out resources for people who were there in Texas history, but there's not a lot of resources in the educational materials usually to tell their stories, especially African-Americans, Mexican Americans and women in particular. So for almost every one of those groups in every section, you're gonna be able to find hopefully some really great materials. So just wanted to um, point that out to you guys. Uh, Jay or Michelle, or Michelle, sorry, Jay or Chastity, uh, if you guys could throw the the um, link to this into the chat for folks, just so they have it. That'd be we'll do, we'll do. All right, um, now that that PSA is over, <laughs> we're gonna dive into what we're gonna talk about today which is the legacies of reconstruction. And as we've talked about, you know, the problem with, I think the way we often teach most subjects in Texas history is we teach them as kind of one-offs. Like this thing just sort of happened and then we move on and it's, we don't usually talk about how things have an effect, not just now, but long-term in Texas history, how they connect over time. But that's one of the most interesting and useful things in studying the past is seeing how things connect over time. So the whole point of today is to help you guys see those threads over time and those connections and to give you guys materials that you can use in later units when you're covering the late 19th and early 20th century that you can, you can tie back to reconstruction so your students can see cause and effect. When something happens in this period, 1865 or 1876, it's gonna have a long-term influence and they need to be able to see those connections, but we have to point them out, all right? So let's catch up from last week. So last week, we talked about the end of Reconstruction. We talked about the Congressional Reconstruction period when Congress took over Reconstruction. And then there's all these fights that happen in places like Texas about who's going to be running the show. The new Republican Party that came to Texas or the former Confederates who would call themselves Redeemers as they reclaim Texas. And when we ended last time, as you guys will recall, is that despite the Republicans in Texas, including the former slaves, reasserting or asserting control and writing their own constitution and trying to empower African Americans in the state um, with their legal rights under the 14th and 15th amendments to the constitution. The former Confederates, like these guys, the people on your screen right now are Terry's Texas Rangers. So these are former Confederates from Texas who will reclaim power in, in the state by eventually getting registered to vote in the early 1870s. And they'll slowly reclaim power, they'll write a new constitution, and they'll take over. And that's how Reconstruction ends. So we left off last time, is with the end of Reconstruction, the answer to our three major questions, right? What happens to the former Confederates like these guys? Well, they, they're pardoned, and then they're readmitted, and they regain pretty much full citizenship status, right? So they come back in over a long period of time, but they come back in essentially as full citizens. Second question, what happens to the states that seceded like Texas? Well, they go through quite a process, right? They write a constitution, then it gets thrown out and they get put under military rule. That's what this map is right here with Texas in the fifth military district. 
But then they write another constitution and basically the states are allowed back in after they ratify the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, and the 15th Amendment, all right? But then they come back in with full representation in Congress and they're, they're as equal as any other state in the union. So Texas is just as much represented in Congress as Pennsylvania, right? And that wasn't a foregone conclusion, but it happens. And then the third question, of course, that Reconstruction answers is what happens to the former slaves? And this is complicated and important, I think, that we, we break this down for our, our students, which is they're free. That's the 13th Amendment. They're citizens. That's the 14th Amendment. And for African-American males, they have the right to vote in theory. So on paper, they're citizens, full citizens. But in reality, on the ground, in the lived experience, they're not gonna be treated as citizens. And that's where we ended Reconstruction with that redeemer constitution that stripped power out of the state, um, state government in Austin, Texas and put power really at the local level, which made it much harder to enforce the rights of African-Americans via the 14th and 15th Amendments to the Constitution, all right? But with that, Reconstruction's over, it's 1870s. 1876 is the usual number that we, or the date that we usually uh, point toward for that. And the question is, what's going to happen now? And so what I wanna do for you guys is to tie two major legacies that come out of Reconstruction. Right, the commitment to really small government in Texas that emerges from Reconstruction, and the regime of Jim Crow, which will raise its head in the late 19th century and continue on legally through the 1960s. Right, so some of these are very long legacies, and I want to show you guys how the fights of Reconstruction lead to those two particular strands in particular. All right, so we're going to start with the small government. Right, and so our central question. Number one, it's gonna frame all of this for us, is how did the fights over reconstruction lead to the embrace of small government by state leaders in Texas during the decades that followed the 1870s? Why do, why do the, the redeemers leave reconstruction deeply committed to small government? They're so committed to small government, in fact, that they're gonna ignore the needs of farmers, as we'll see. And you guys know about the populist rebellion. This is gonna lead directly to the populist revolt in the 1890s, all right? So that's where we're heading. But the answer to the question is that, why do they go this so hardcore towards small government and hang on to it? Because for the redeemers, the ex-Confederates, at the end of Reconstruction, the lesson they learned, they think, is that the Republicans were causing mayhem because they were using government too much. They were using it to empower African-Americans. They were using it to, um, to create a school system that cost a lot of money. They were using it to jack up taxes that paid for that, that public education system. And so for the Redeemers, someone like this guy, you guys remember this guy, Richard Koch, all right? He is the first Redeemer governor elected in Texas in 1873. Their goal is to take back, redeem the government, and then make sure that never happens again. And the way that they do that is that they strip out all the power in the state government. They don't, they're not even states rights people. They don't even want the state to have power. They want counties, local jurisdictions to have power because they know the local county sheriff and wherever is gonna do what the local county sheriff needs to do. Um, but if they strip power out of the state government, they can make sure that it's not used against them, it's Confederates, it won't be used to empower their former slaves. And so they strip power basically as down as small as it can. We talked about right? We talked about how the Redeemer Constitution basically says, you really can't do anything now. You can't even pay for public education in the state. It's literally forbidden in this Constitution, right? Which is astounding. All right, so that's the lesson. And that's the lesson they're going to run with, right? They're going to run as far as they can, because these ex-Confederates become the governors of Texas for the next many governorships, right? So the guy in the middle right here, that's Richard Koch. He is succeeded by, you know, here's a bunch of these guys. These are all redeemer governors, as I call them, right? So anyone who went to Texas A&M or knows about it, that's Sol Ross up there on the left with his goatee. The guy in the bottom left, that's a guy named John Ireland that virtually no one's ever heard of. Um, you guys remember the guy on the right here, right? Evil Santa Claus. This is Orrin Roberts, the guy who was the chair of the secession convention. He becomes governor after Reconstruction's over. And he's a redeemer, baby. He believes again in stripping out power because he wants to, as he described it earlier, make sure African-Americans 
have no rights whatsoever, but he also wants to keep government small because he doesn't want it to be used against him or his fellow ex-Confederates or anything like that, all right? So they strip it down to its absolute core. And you can see this lots of different ways. Um, one of the best examples of this is the convict lease system um, that emerges in Texas. It's not just in Texas, I wanna point that out, it is across the South. Almost all ex-Confederate states do something similar. But what Texas does in the aftermath of the Civil War is they, they look around and go, hmm, how can we not pay for things? Well, one thing we could do is we could turn over the, the penitentiary system to private enterprise. And so from 1871 to 1883, the state turned over its jail and penitentiary system to private industry. They just leased it out. They just, that's, they, they, they turned over the keys. And private industry wanted to, companies wanted to take over because then they could use the labor and sell the labor of the convicts. So the way it would work is private company would take over a jail and then they would lease out, they would lend out convicts at very low prices. And we're talking about super low compared to what it would cost to hire someone to, I don't know, quarry rocks or do some hard labor somewhere else. You could go down to the penitentiary and then rent out a convict who of course wasn't getting paid for any of this at very low rates. And then you could work them virtually to death. And there was no consequence to that. These are convicts. There's no like protection system. There's no oversight. There's no like effort to make sure they're well fed or cared for or that they're even vaguely safe. You could and often were worked literally to death. All right. And I'm not saying that you need to feel bad for someone who's committed murder, who's in this situation necessarily, although they're still a human being. But most of these people who are being put through the system are not uh, guilty of violent crimes. They are being convicted in this, in this legal system in Texas, very often African-Americans, very often for very tiny, if any, charges whatsoever, like vagrancy and things that are ill-defined. And so you have this massive system that takes these people and then puts them to work and profits off of them. Some historians have called this slavery by another name. Um, and it's just horrific exploitation. But it was very profitable. It cost the state nothing. It actually made the state money. And it was so profitable that in 1883, the state took it back over so that they could make money themselves. So instead of having private companies, they just cut out the private companies. And then the state of Texas itself was leasing out convicts all over the place. And they did that until 1912, when the abuses of that system were so horrific that the, the progressives eventually helped put an end to this. And thank God for that. But I, I bring it up as an example, simply to say that this was the approach of the redeemers and then their kids and then their grandkids toward the state government. Make it as small as possible, then make it smaller, and then, as the saying goes, drown it in a bathtub. All right, so this is not something that they're, they're wanting to, to pay for. This becomes a problem, though. Why? Because there are actual problems that face farmers in Texas during this time period that they cannot deal with or fix themselves. So if they have a ma massive problem that they can't fix themselves, they needed state government help to do something about it. But what they're going to run into is that the state government won't do anything about that. And that will create great anger over time, as you can imagine. And that is what is going to lead to one of the biggest political revolts in all of American history, the populist revolt. All right? So I'm gonna tell you guys a little story of the populist revolt. I know you guys probably know a good bit of the story, but I wanna walk through it a little bit to demonstrate how 